I am so blessed. So I begin uh, by sharing an excerpt from an article entitled, Love is Not Enough, and it's written by Mark Manson. In 1967, John Lennon wrote a song called, All You Need Is Love. He also beat both of his wives, abandoned one of his children, verbally abused his gay Jewish manager with homophobic and anti-Semitic slurs, and once had a camera crew film him, film him lying in his bed for an entire day. 35 years later, Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails wrote a song called Love is Not Enough. Despite being famous for his shocking stage performances and his grotesque and disturbing videos, got clean from all drugs and alcohol, married one woman, had two children with her, and then canceled an entire album tour so that he could stay home to be a good husband and father. One of these two men had a clear and realistic understanding of love and one of them did not. One of these men idolized love as a solution to all of his problems, and one of them did not. One of these men was probably a narcissistic, and one of them was not. In our culture, many of us idolize love. We see it as some lofty cure-all for all life's problems. Our movies and our stories and our history all celebrate it as life's ultimate goal, the final solution for all of our pain and struggle. And because we idolize love, we overestimate it. And as a result, our relationship pay a price. So I share this excerpt with you entitled Love is Not Enough, not to have a debate over which man had a better understanding of love or to vilify John Lennon and raise up Renzer, Reznor, sorry. In John chapter 8, verse 7, Jesus says, let anyone among you his, who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at him. And when we look at sin, we mean when we are not coming from our wholeness, when we miss the mark. And all of us, all of us knows the experience of when we have lived from our woundedness and from our own suffering. And none of us are without shortcomings. So the purpose of sharing that article was for us to look, look through many lenses. Look at the many lenses that we do understand and view, lo view love. And so what I would hope that we can do is to have that cultural understanding, that human understanding of how we see love that has been conditioned within us from the modeling of our families, from our culture, from society. It is just what we repeat in pattern. And then I would like us to look at, we have explored many times over our power of love. Joyce read beautifully that where we are in consciousness, we use our power of love um, accordingly. And so we have that understanding of the metaphysics of love, which is beyond the physical. And then what I am really been feeling called by many of my own teachers, my own mentors, is for us to be called into even beyond the, mis the metaphysical, into the mystical experience of love. It is something that it was really hard to put together because 
The mystical experience really cannot be defined in words. And although we try to listen to the descriptions of the masters and teachers of their mystical experiences, it is something, it is a state of being. It is something deep within us that goes beyond our human understanding and even our metaphysical understanding. And as I share, as we get to that, we're going to explore um, the cultural, the human understanding. We're going to explore briefly again the metaphysical understanding. And then as I share some wisdom from Eric Butterworth and Charles Fillmore, um, just notice if your mind says, this is a, um, this is bull. Um, or tries to argue with it that this can't be possible. Um, and, and if that comes up, I just invite you to notice it because you can be sure your personal mind and all of the hurts that are still active within you is what's speaking to you. I am sure that all the mystics um, who spoke of it, who we are drawn to for a reason, that in our faith we must know that the truest desire is to evolve to that experience and living from the flow of God and not just talking about it. And so I'd like to start um, with first our human under understanding of it. And so Charles Fillmore um, shares with us that human love is based on personality and is selfish, selfish, sorry, lawless and fickle. What he means lawless means that it doesn't abide by truth principles or the laws of, um, of God, so to speak. And he says that personality is a veil or mask worn by humankind that conceals the real, the spiritual I am. And our personality self is that which we have been conditioned to be, to think. Um, what has been modeled by um, our families, our teachers, so on and so on. And we are born with this idea that we are empty vessels and that we must get everything from the world out here. We go to school to get our wisdom and instead of realizing it's about under, uncovering the wisdom that is within. Now, I'm not saying that there's not a place for studying. God only knows I've been a lifelong student. But it's then, again, going within and seeing what resonates. You know when you're reading something, and it is a truth. Because for me, it's like my hair stands up, and there's just some feeling or some experience happens that even if it first frightens me, knows that I am in the presence of something universally universal and truthful in that sense. And so in our humanness, we have been conditioned that we must get it, get love from out there. And we, according to Eric Butterworth, love is a commodity. It is an object. It is something we give. It is something we get. It is something that must be earned. It is something that we must control or hold on to. It is something that we barter and keep score over. And Butterworth says, we have been misled to a large extent by psychology, teachings that claim that the greatest need of humankind is to be loved, that somehow suggests love is a commodity, rather than a cosmic process, which simplicity supposes that our lives lack love because we have not been given it. Now, you may be saying, well, we can't live without love. So I want you to hold on to that. Yes, but it is about being in the flow of that love so just, just hold that for a moment. 
So I want to look at some examples of looking at love as a commodity. Well, if I love them enough, they will change. Loving him is so damn exhausting. After all I've done for her, can you believe I got nothing for my birthday? Uh, I have sacrificed so much for them, and when I need them, they are nowhere to be found. I let her borrow money, and can you believe she was not available to take me to the doctors when I asked her? Uh, and if he loved me enough, he would know what I need. And if we are all honest... I think we can all say that we have been there, that we have been operating from our personality selves about bartering and earning it and love being conditional. And so now I invite us to look at love through the metaphysical lens. It is one of our, sp our 12 spiritual powers not just an emotion or a feeling, but it is one of our powers. And love is our ability to desire, desire to attract, to harmonize, and to unify. And so I want to look at desire and attraction. So that which we hold as a desire in thought, in word, in action, in feeling, we energize because we are energy beings and then we are vibrating at that level of that desire and from that level of where we are in consciousness and so when we harmonize harmonize means to bring into accord or agreement so where we are in consciousness will bring everything into accord so if i am coming from a place of victim my will bring in accord or harmonize my actions, my words, everything that will be in accord of that. And so the law of attraction basically says, I draw myself to that which is a vibration of my experience. Um, and we can say, well, not everything is a mirror there. Well, it may not be exactly what you are mirroring, but it is mirroring something. It is teaching. It is drawing you to look within. Everything in life is our teacher. So I would like to now go to the metaphysical. I mean, the mystical. Charles Fillmore states that the pure essence of being it is the pure essence of being that binds together the whole human family. Essence of being. The pure essence of being is what we call God. And God is the universal life force that is the essence of all creation. It is not some being in, in, a, on a, in a cloud somewhere out there. And when we say... God is love, we are saying God is the flow. And when I am in the flow of creation, I experience the love. Not that I'm getting something from this deity, but I am experiencing a purity of energy and flow so deep and so divine that it brings forth the divine nature within me, the divine goodness within me. And so when we say God is love, then I am that love expressing and God is life. I am that life expressing and so on and so on. And so for the mystical experience, it is not about doing something out there. It is not about getting something, trying to manipulate someone, trying to change your circumstances, but it is to Remove all that weighs heavy on your heart. To remove all that blocks. This actually, his teaching is in alignment for those of you who have been studying um, the untethered soul, where Michael Singer says that it is 
for us to be in the seat of our awareness, to be in the heart center of our being, to be in the flow of Shakti, the Holy Spirit within us is the ultimate. And from that place, we spring forth and we are guided. It is not something we can be planned, but the, the guidance from within will lead us to serve the moment from that place of consciousness. And when we are harboring resent, resentments, unforgiveness, hatred, anger, um, we can never really be totally in the experience of the flow. The flow is always present, but we become asleep to it because we are nursing our wounds. And when we are in personal mind, we will argue that this is all woo-woo and is not possible. So I just share um, what Butterworth says. Love springs forth from an attunement with the cosmic flow. Love is not giving something, rather it is being something. And the great need is not to be loved, but to be loved by living from the cosmic flow of God. And he gives to, uh, a deeper understanding uh, than just the metaphysics of the two great commandments that the master teacher Jesus spoke of. And those two great commandments are to love God with our whole heart, with our soul, with our mind, with everything, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So taking a deeper look at the first one, when we are unified in the flow, our mind, our heart, when we are centered in that flow within our heart, that is what it means to love God with your whole heart. It is not idol worship. It is not idol worshiping of a, of a divine master, of Jesus, of Buddha, of this one or that one. Now, I am not saying that we don't have reverence and that we don't study their teachings and that we don't hold them so deeply in our hearts. But every single master says, do not bow to me as your master, but to go within and know you as the flow of life, of love, and of the master. And so when we move to loving thy neighbor, it's not about changing the neighbor. It's not trying to like how the neighbor acts um, or what the, your neighbor is, is doing. But it's again, going back into the flow. So if everything, I am powerless to what I see out here. And so I draw myself back in knowing that it's not about, as Butterworth would say, it's not about setting it right. It's about seeing it right. And I'm not talking about with our human understanding seeing. I'm talking about spiritual sight. And so then we go in to the flow and we ask, how may I return to this flow? What is weighing heavy on my heart? What is being shown here? What resistance do I hold based on the actions, based on how this person is showing up? What am I allowing to block the flow that is within me? And he uses a, an example, which... Um, for those, again, who studied the um, Untethered Soul, where Michael Singer tells us to start with low-hanging fruit, meaning that we practice loving our neighbor um, with smaller things. We don't start with somebody who maybe did the biggest infraction against us or victimized us, betrayed us so deeply and, and, and um, so deeply, but we start with something that maybe we don't have the deepest relationship with. So Butterworth gives the example of being on the subway, a bus, or being in the supermarket, and maybe the behavior of somebody, or just you don't like the way, the attitude of somebody. 
is to begin breathing. Become aware of your heart space. And as you take those deep breaths in and out, your goal is to become aware of the oneness and the flow of the divine that is within. Now the true practice of whether it's meditation, of mindfulness, um, those who find gardening meditative, all those that bring you back to a place of center are all ways that bring you back to the awareness of the flow. And it is where, again, this goes to the indescribable, where everything in your world is okay, your heart opens, and then from that space, you look out at your neighbor. And from that space, your world is changed. And a lot of times when we come from that place, again, because we are vibrational beings, we have the power, not because we're trying to manipulate, but because our, our desire is coming from a very high vibration that we are vibrating from that place that it has the power to impact our surroundings. And I share um, a story um, from when I was uh, teaching and I was teaching high school. And uh, when I was teaching, I had some very, it was like a couple years into teaching, I had some very challenging students. Um, and one of which was labeled disaffected, um, who, refused to do anything in class, was not interested, um, pretty much didn't talk to anybody, ignored you, and sometimes um, acted very condescending. And so I remember um, just holding, holding him in prayer. And instead of living from that space of wanting him to do something, to be something, to do the lesson, to like my curriculum, I just would energize myself and I would breathe out from that place. And, you know, it brought me to try to seek understanding. And, you know, slowly um, I, I got to understand what some of the things that he started to open up and he started to share some things that he was interested in. He was an artist, he was an incredible artist, so I would allow him to draw. And then one day, slowly, in that space of opening with him, um, I found out that, because I was supposed to teach him reading, <laughs> um, I found out that he loved Hunt for the Red October. And so I said, you know what? That's not our curriculum, but let's read for the Hunt for a Red October. And we started getting into this, this book and I was able to, you know, do comprehension and explore different things with him. And it just so happened that um, one of my observations that year was by the superintendent. And, uh, you know, he came in my room and so I'm like, I'm just gonna go ahead and read The Hunt for Red October. Whether he tells me it's not the curriculum or not, uh, I'm letting that go. And when he left, he said to me, the superintendent, he said, you know, I have observed him today. It just so happened. I didn't just so happened how it turned out, but I've been doing observations of many teachers today. And this is my third time <laughs> that I've seen the student. It just so happened that he's been in these other classes. And he said, and I don't know what you're doing, but this is the only time I've ever seen him engaged. And again, it wasn't anything fancy or, I mean, anything that was part of the curriculum, but it was the desire for me to see him different. But that seeing couldn't happen if I couldn't come from that place deep within me. And so, I share one more final story with you, which was in um, practical metaphysics. And as I share that story, my heart just wells up. Oh, so um, 
this is in Practical Metaphysics, and it was a story shared by Eric Butterworth. Some time ago, a colleague told me about how he moved out of anger and discord with a friend. It seems that a friend who was a writer wanted to publish a story of a very unusual incident that my colleague had been involved in. And so he asked him for his permission to publish the story. The man felt sure that certain phrasings of the stories might be embarrassing and even harmful to other people involved. And so he refused to let his friend publish the story. His writer friend became furious with him and stamped off in a rage. This was disturbing to my colleague because this friendship meant a lot to him. They've been friends for many years. He struggled with his conscience because he wanted to do the right thing. He weighed in the balance, the process, and felt tempted for a while to say, oh well, I want my friendship more than anything. But he stood by his principle. And after some time, he finally realized that he was going to have to get himself straightened out in consciousness. He began to take frequent times in the stillness to deal with himself. He forgot about his friend for a while, and this is what he realized. It took time and stillness to get himself centered in consciousness, in the consciousness of love, in the flow of the divine. It took time to get himself filled with the realization that in this divine flow of love, there can be no separation. There can be no confusion. There can be no ill will, no hurt, no anger. He waited until he could get himself completely at ease in his consciousness before he did anything further. Then what did he do? He simply looked up from the consciousness of love. He didn't try to send him anything. He didn't try to project any thoughts. He didn't try to speak a lot of words across the miles. He just sat with him in the consciousness of love. And within 48 hours later, a letter came saying that his friend had suddenly felt very foolish in his attitude. His attachment to wanting to publish the story made him seek counsel about it. And the lawyer told him he might open himself to charges of libel if he published the article. He then said after sitting with it that he had a change of heart. He apologized and even thanked the man for his integrity to holding to what was right and saving him from a great deal of unpleasantness and saying incidentally, I am so glad that our friendship has not been destroyed and I could hardly wait to see you. And my friends know that the discontent that lies or within us emanates from a very deep desire to live from the conscious flow of God, of the life force. It is from that desire to be more, to be a greater expression of the divine. And so I invite you into the mystical experience of love, the love that surpasses all human understanding. Blessings. I send you my deep appreciation. Thank you so much, Reverend Angela. It's beautiful as always. I invite everyone to silently Say our affirmative prayer by Eric Butterworth. God is love, and I am that love expressing in and through as my loving heart. Mm.